Buenas, mi nombre es Dante Choque, soy Victoria. Good morning, my name is Dante Choque. I'm a postdoctoral research in the research group from Intercultural Processes. On behalf of this research group from Intercultural Processes in Architecture, Urbanism, and Territory of the University of Concepcion, we welcome you to our social media networks, YouTube, Facebook Live. This first international seminar called Decolonizing Urban Territories, Processes of State Colonization and Indigenous Resistance that is being held on November 22, 23, and 24. The call for this seminar was directed to researchers trained under different colonial languages, but in English and Spanish, in order to talk about different processes of dispossession faced today by indigenous peoples of the world on the logics and mechanisms of urban production with continued colonization of territories within the nation state. With this scale, we shared several questions inviting to open the reflection and the conversation. So we try to answer the next question. How are irregular urbanization processes occurring in rural areas inhabited by indigenous people? How do urban planning instruments impact indigenous populations? How are ethnic real estate projects created and promoted? How are identities produced through the construction of intercultural buildings and public spaces? These and other questions are our main of interest. According to this, we received different papers from different perspectives, different disciplines and voices that together showed us a wide range of considerations, both historical and daily, as well as the various forms in which these processes of urban colonization are expressed in different parts of the world and with different indigenous peoples as well as a wide range of forms of reorganization and resistance that continue to develop systems. They continue to their own peoples. This panorama ratified the validity and relevance of this territorial issue in critical scenarios, as well as the urgent need to rethink and promote new spaces for dialogue beyond the strict traditional academic formats to give space to the possibility to encounter between different voices, exchange ideas, critical reflection, and create proposals. During these days of the seminar, the people who are watching this will be all of these different topics over not only by an academic view, this end, in addition to the roundtable in the mornings, during the afternoon, we will have the fields of conversation integrated by people who are inserted and committed in different ways, such as art, public management, organization, etc. Also, these roundtables will have the possibility to receive questions from the public and the audience for social media, looking to expand the form and scope of the data. In this round table, we have three people that are going to talk about different topics. We have Andres Mataru, is going to talk about the challenge of recognition and the colonial city in South Chile in the Latin American context. Then we're gonna hear Camila Sanzana. She's an architect. Oh. No, sorry. Her presentation is called Educational Architecture Principles of Modernization in the Design of Schools in La Araucanía in 1883 and 1930. And finally, Stephanie Alvarez will present about critical mapping of Japón. 
tender taps and local history through the name of streets in the capital of the Araucanía, Chile. The dynamics of these round tables are subdivided in three moments. We first are going to hear the expositions, the presentations. Each presenter will have 15 minutes to present. Then we will have a dialogue for five minutes. And then I'm going to close with a brief summary of the conversation. So I give you the floor. The first presentation of the second round table is this seminar, Andres Mugagu, with his presentation, The Challenge of Recognition and the Colonial City in Southern Chile in Latin American countries. Muchas gracias, then, eh, Dante. Thank you very much, Dante. Eh, me gustó eso de Macondo. I like that, Macondo. Nunca me habían latinoamericanizado tanto. Yes. Así que muchas gracias. No, Latinoamericanizado. Andrés yeah, I loved it. I'm sorry, no, I love it. <laughs> um, bueno, voy a iniciar okay. mi presentación. I'm going to start eh, my presentation. Aquí está. ¿Qué ves? Um, la hice... Muy artesanalmente, pero very, dedicadamente um, también. Very handmade, but with lots um, of dedication. Bueno, yo aquí ya dejé de, de verme so, y verlo a ustedes, así que alguien me I puede decir por audio si se ve. So could you please tell me by ah, aún no, no veo la pantalla. ¿No se ve? Not yet. Ah, no. Now we cannot see. Una, una interesante... Ah, pero, oh, per, oh. perdón, ahora voy a... Sorry, sorry. Now I'm going to share. Just give me a moment. I'm sharing my screen. Okay. Ahora sí. Okay. Can you see it now? Sí. Yes. Now we can. Um, bueno. Great. Nuevamente. Eh, Once again. Bueno, primero. <coughs> well, first. Yo sé que están todos cansados y. I know that you're all han, tired. Han habido muchas presentaciones. And we have had many eh, Pero eh, agregar, me gustaría yeah. felicitarlos por like la instancia. Me parece súper, súper. My congratulations eh, for this muy urgente opportunity for this y seminar. Fundamental, I think eh, it's very urgent and it's key. Que, que no, no, es, no, no sé si es inédita, pero, pero me, 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 me gusta mucho la, la organización. Before, y las like preguntas que se plantean, las que acaba de, de plantear Dante, también me parece súper relevante. Eh, para comprender su marco analítico, utilizar, eh, para comprender este fenómeno lleno de dilemas que tiene que ver con descolonizar territorios urbanos. The colonizing Voy a hablar un poco más lento. I'm going to speak a little slower because sometimes I bueno, speak too fast. Eh, well, es my title ambicioso. is very ambitious and eh, also wide. So I hope to be, que me, que yo mismo me, me propuse. to be enough for the eh, purpose that I myself este set. Título, que mm -hmm. llamo el desafío de reconocimiento y la ciudad colonial en el sur de Chile. Recognizing the colonial city in the south of Chile in the Latin American country. por problematizar dos conceptos muy relevantes que se mencionan. Problematize two very important concepts that are mentioned in the seminario que tiene que ver con el reconocimiento y la idea también de ciudad colonial. La pregunta es The ¿Cuánto rinden is, estos conceptos eh, para las luchas descoloniales? Y la idea de ciudad colona, struggles. And the idea eh, of a colonial en, en inglés city, settler city, que in English, siempre es una traducción compleja al, al español, always, always eh, into Spanish, si rinde eh, realmente como useful, pudiera ser. As eh, it should be. 
Este, claro, este concepto de ciudad colona, so, this no sé cómo podría traducir, city, city, que se produce en el marco de la teoría de la colonización mediante el colonialismo, settler colonialism, o también muchas veces lo traducen como colonialismo and, de colonos, eh, genera mucha controversia en, en el contexto latinoamericano, eh, pero que, que dada la diversidad de formas de colonización, pareciera ser bastante intuitivo el, el, la categoría, la teoría, eh, para el, especialmente para el contexto del cono sur, eh, dado que este espacio geográfico constituye una, un, área, un área autónoma y de soberanía de varios pueblos indígenas que son, como todos sabemos, anexados por vía de la ocupación militar hace no mucho tiempo, a diferencia de el resto de América Ahora, mi apuesta acá, muy en el ánimo de las preguntas, que, que el, que el seminario invita a, a, a contribuir, a problematizar. Eh, mi apuesta es utilizar el concepto de ciudad colona o settler city para un periodo histórico donde sería contraintuitivo utilizarlo, como lo es el periodo hispano-colonial tardío. Eh, bueno, a partir de eso, luego me voy a hacer algunas preguntas sobre el reconocimiento y las luchas descolonizadoras en contexto que me surgen a partir de la lectura de Glenn Coulthard y otros autores, considerando la relevancia del de problema práctico y teórico que, que invita a este seminario y que tiene que ver con la ciudad. It's calling for, um, and it's related to the city. Es un dilema, porque, this dilemma, bueno, me imagino, ya lo han mencionado muchas veces, this is a eh, because I imagine pero varias de las luchas often, eh, en los contextos de colonización apuntan a regiones o territorios. Obviamente esto es una generalización, pero en Obviously, general, this is a generalization, la, la, la fuerza y el foco eh, está pensado en mantener eh, la identidad y modos de vida tradicionales, por lo general dando la espalda a la ciudad, que vienen a reforzar la dicotomía urbana y, y, y el problema es que hacen del espacio urbano de su poder público una instancia liberada de disputas por la interpretación. Y no solamente respecto de los procesos urbanos, sino que también dejan un plan abierto en los mismos procesos de indigenidad. Bueno, no sé si voy muy rápido o voy muy lento, pensando en las traducciones. Y pensando en el tiempo. Bueno, esto último lo menciono porque This last thing I mentioned lo, lo, lo que mencionaba anteriormente, porque en la literatura uh, sobre la formación de identidades de grupos y étnicas de conflicto, se suele explicar desde la ya clásica formulación de Frederick Park quien afirmaba que lo más fundamental para la conformación de grupos eh, es la alteridad, donde el centro o el núcleo identitario de un grupo no se proyecta hacia, sino que se proyecta desde los bordes identitarios que separan a los grupos. De esta, de esta manera, es la alteridad entre grupos lo que a través de los límites determina el centro gravitatorio de la identidad. Y esto tiene una repercusión clave para comprender las identidades espaciales. Eh, así, la territorialidad se modelaría en función de la historia de disputas por el espacio. Y en este proceso también, eh, se le va dando contenido a la dimensión espacial de la identidad. Bueno, este marco de análisis nos lleva a un modelo, finalmente un modelo sociológico, donde los, los grupos van a disputarse 
la hegemonía en la adscripción de estos rasgos eh, y características que, que es relevante cuando introducimos la, el análisis del poder. Porque esto suele conducir eh, a la conclusión de que un grupo en esta dinámica saldrá perjudicado en esta pugna y lo más problemático, que um, su propia definición, o sea, la autodefinición de límites identitarios quedarán subsumidos en la proyección que logra imponer el grupo dominante en la interacción. En, en palabras de Jean Paul Sartre, el antisemita hacia el judío, eh, que también es parte de... Eh, el, el problema de del reconocimiento de la tradición por lo general hegeliana de la, de la interpretación del concepto en esta metáfora del amo y del entonces, esto nos lleva a concluir que en las relaciones históricas los grupos dominantes y vencedores finalmente pasando de una etnogénesis tras otra, determinan y definen la identidad y los contornos de los grupos dominados, contornos muchas veces espaciales, que en el caso de las ciudades corresponde a esta delimitación forzada de distintos hábitats culturales eh, que promoverían ya sobre la previa división campo-ciudad esta dicotomía urbana. Bueno, comienzo con esta provocación porque es el marco socioantropológico desde el cual se suele analizar la conformación de la identidad social en relaciones de alteridad interétnica y nos lleva a un callejón sin salida esta, este planteamiento, este modelo. Eh, en el dilema del reconocimiento y la descolonización de los espacios urbanos, lo cual voy a seguir profundizando. Entonces, eh, este es un mapa de el Futa Willimapu. Hace, bueno, es un mapa muy, muy artesanal que hice. Es muy... Muy humilde, pero, pero es explicativo. Es simple, um, for explaining... Cuando se habla de la pacificación de la Araucanía como un eu eufemismo bastante insultante eh, de la invasión militar y ocupación a sangre y fuego del Gualmapu, me parece que hay algo similar con un episodio histórico que ocurre casi un siglo antes, a fines del siglo XVIII, que es conocido como la repoblación de Osorno. Y que hay varias interpretaciones, pero a mi modo de ver, constituye un, un rotundo aplastamiento de las autonomías territoriales del espacio geográfico, conocido como Futa al sur de la Plaza Valdivia. Eh, para autores como Lorenzo Veracini sería inadecuado eh, emplear la, la teoría del colonialismo mediante colonialismo o colonialismo del colono para aplicado al Imperio Español. El Imperio Español sería un caso prototípico de relaciones coloniales mercantiles asociadas a una red de nodos comerciales y de producción que apuntan a una lejana metrópoli europea. Sin embargo, eh, analizando este caso, a, es, la repoblación de Osorno, de eh, podemos ver que también estuvo acompañado el Imperio Español en su fase tardía por procesos de colonización a través de emplazamientos urbanos y el despliegue de una dominación biopolítica basada en la raza, donde destacan formas de exclusión fundamental de la población indígena y las consecuencias, consecuentes técnicas de dominación. Y que en este episodio particular, In this particular ocurre episode, simultáneo it y en el mismo lugar al célebre Tratado de las Canoas de 1793, donde Ambrosio Higgins eh, y parte de los agregados territoriales mapuche huilliches de la zona 
Pactan la paz. Mapuche will teach Luego de un proceso de exterminio, in the area, they treat the perpetrado peace bajo el liderazgo de Tomás de Figueroa. Este suceso es bien relevante, ya que bajo la amenaza de exterminio total, las parcialidades mapuche huilliche se les perdona la vida bajo el costo de ceder las tierras alrededor de las ruinas de la ciudad de Osorno, que había sido destruida 200 años antes. Osorno, that was destroyed 200 bueno, years ago. Adicionalmente, Additionally, a los, acá eh, eh, hice un, here, una, you can see una, una a timeline, ordenamiento, la crónica de, de la campaña de exterminio de Tomás de Figueroa, que es bastante atroz, y lo pueden ver en, en, by Tomás de Figueroa, en el diario. De, de, you can see it in the, bueno, una vez ocurre este episodio, eh, al año siguiente se pacta la paz, el Tratado de las Canoas, donde destaca una condición fundamental, es explícito en las cartas que se pueden leer y estudiar, y es que parte de los acuerdos es no referirse más a las matanzas que habían ocurrido el año anterior. Ni tampoco la afectación económica en la subsistencia de las familias que habían sufrido de esta ocupación y esta, esta campaña. Bueno, algo muy relevante es que este episodio es tratado como una gesta heroica con caracteres religiosos. Sin embargo, cuando uno analiza los documentos, este es principalmente un proyecto geopolítico de ocupación total del territorio. También es un proyecto de desplazamiento de la frontera agraria y es un proyecto de especialización en la agricultura. Entonces, esto se refleja, por ejemplo, en que para el cumplimiento de la nueva función de este espacio geográfico, rebautizado el Futabuyimapo como los Llanos de Osorno, se requería de un sujeto con un perfil de productividad específico. Y aquí leo una, un extracto. Dice, una carta enviada desde Ambrosio Higgins al gobernador de esta nueva zona. Es, cons es consiguiente que sus nuevos habitantes nada deben ser más que labradores. Prohibirá por ahora el cateo, el descubrimiento y trabajo de minas, laderos de oro, plata y cobre. Aplíquese usted a hacer comprender a estos pobladores que las verdaderas minas y riquezas deben buscarlas y encontrarlas en la agricultura y crianza de ganados. Las ocupaciones de sembrar y construir casas, los pobladores se han de hacer desde luego y siempre compatibles con la crianza de ganados mayores y menores y contar este ejercicio como un ramo de la agricultura que debe ser la profesión de los pobladores. En este sentido, la, la destinación de las tierras, uso y usufructo de ellas, estaba condicionado por la vara de la productividad y, la, y cómo se transformaba dicho espacio. Así, eh, la planificación y definición de quiénes eran los merecedores a ocupar y vivir, y vivir en estos espacios estaba ya pensada de antes y sacó otro resultado. Las tierras repartidas deben hacerse constantemente útiles en ambos objetos y el que por abandono y, ne y negligencia no las sembrare o cercare deberá perderlas y de arrojarle de la población como un bien inútil. Dejará libres ambos terrenos para aplicarse a cualquier nuevo poblador que se presente, precedida justificación para todo de que en dos años consecutivos ha dejado de cultivarlas. Me disculpan las traductoras por lo difícil de, del ritmo y traducir esto, pero, pero en general la idea es que Aquí se inaugura un proyecto colonial y un régimen de comportamiento sobre las tierras que exigía un estándar de legitimidad en la posesión 
had an que standard clasifica de inútiles la, las tierras en situación de tendencia mapuche huilliche como también eh, sus habitantes. And also their Sin embargo, algo eh, adicional que, 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 se, que, que es nuevo en esto, en este episodio, es que se, se, se inaugura un nuevo régimen jurídico en el cual no era posible la explotación del trabajo eh, indígena, dado que se había abolido la encomienda. Por lo tanto, aquí eh, se produce una exclusión de la población de mapuche en el proyecto económico de eh, este nuevo espacio. Eh, bueno, hay varios detalles, eh, pero algo muy relevante es cómo se, ad, ad, se, se, una vez se instala Once eh, this el aparato is militar settled, en la ciudad se desbordan digamos lo, los espacios que habían sido so pactados en el tratado changed. y se produce un control hacia el interior de los cordones eh, interandinos los pasos que era la principal eh, estrategia eh, bio, eh, eh, geopolítica de las territorio autonómico del eh, Mambucho en esta zona con por el mapa. Eh, este Mapuche se produce un cierre de esos pasos, map. un control so del they valle block y con el paso del tiempo they control the una, and una, the una un, dado que no se podía eh, explotar la mano de obra eh, Mapuche Huilliche, entonces comienza la enajenación de tierras. It started this, this possession of land. Y por lo tanto, el, el colapso del sistema so, eh, autónomo que había sido durante muchos siglos, el, el for y, y que a posterior, eh, estas, estas medidas, o sea, measures, ya sea la inmovilización, la incomunicación, la concentración y la reducción de la población, posterior a la campaña de exterminio y el, y el sucesivo despliegue por el control, fueron eh, las, las medidas para la creación y consolidación de la propiedad no indígena en esta jurisdicción, que solo, solo unas décadas más tarde, es el destino de las primeras formas de colonización alemana durante el nuevo régimen del Estado Nacional. Bueno, hay varios detalles que, que no voy a alcanzar a mencionar, pero, pero lo, lo importante es que, que captura un momento donde la teoría de la ciudad colona es bastante poderosa para comprender la tesis de que en estas regiones ya de manera that temprana, regions, podemos ver que existía un comportamiento times, económico colonial que explícitamente excluía a la población indígena luego de procesos de eliminación, utilizando como dispositivo espacial fundamental el proyecto urbano, lo cual parecería una anomalía en el contexto hispano-colonial, hispano pero que inaugura lo que se va a producir un siglo más tarde. Eh, bueno, esto, eh, estoy consciente de, de, de varios de los reparos respecto del de uso de la teoría de la ciudad colona, debido a que se, se puede criticar que es demasiado maniqueo. Eh, esto ya es parte de la reflexión final, digamos, termino. Eh, y, que no, y que tiende a, a pasar por alto la complejidad de los fenómenos espaciales de su eh, de poder que, que ocurre. Además que se critica por... Eh, yo mismo me, me problematizo esta, el uso de esta categoría. Eh, el problema también es que refuerza la, la misma forma de relatar estos sucesos históricos que, que también se, se producen en alianza con el pueblo colonial. O sea, es una narrativa colonial que, que puede inducir a un enclaustramiento en el poder de las estructuras finalmente. 
que es una eh, lectura estructuralista. Y eso puede sacrificar la, la misma capacidad de agencia, finalmente, de eh, la, los pueblos colonizados o subordinados o en una situación de, de dominación que incluso puede opacar las resistencias que, que se producen contra estos proyectos y también eh, opacar la, la vitalidad de los procesos de descolonización. Entonces, eh, de hecho, el mejor ejemplo de, esta, de este cuestionamiento, esta teoría, o de mi propia formulación, mi propia forma de analizarlo, es que el mismo tratado de las canoas, que yo hice alusión recién, hoy día es reivindicado como un hito en la historia del reconocimiento de los territorios huilliches, o al menos como un piso mínimo desde el cual reivindicar las demandas actuales, eh, luego de la expoliación anterior y que también se reproduce en la actualidad. Entonces, aquí nos vemos, y estas son mis preguntas, nos vemos constantemente en la paradoja de cómo diagnosticar las formas de dominación ante las cuales apuntar los dardos y desplegar las formas de lucha más efectiva. En ese sentido, el aporte de un diagnóstico tan devastado es que, es que permite reconstruir y resignificar los procesos de exclusión impuestos por la, la subordinación de los procesos que inducen los procesos de colonización. Y así poder reconstruir los potenciales contrafácticos. Ese es un concepto muy, muy clave eh, que pueden conducir a la impugnación de las injusticias actuales. Hay una, una última reflexión que no sé si alcanzo. ¿Cuánto me queda, Dante? Bueno, no alcanzó un poco a mencionar, okay. bueno, lo, lo he mencionado, el mean. dilema del reconocimiento. The el mismo caso del Tratado de las Canoas. Eh, the same thing of the treaty vemos, of, si las ponemos, canoes, es un hito importante de reconocimiento territorial, pero, pero si uno pone en la lupa, en el, en, el, en, el, en el suceso, en el hito, vemos que estuvo lleno de, de dominación, de poder. De, we see this domination, this power, and the subordination. Entonces, eh, so, es un dilema gigantesco siempre el reconocimiento. Dilemma, y, recognition. It always is. Es, se puede entender como la subjetivación finalmente de proyecciones provenientes de la dominación, llámese capitalista, patriarcal, heteronormativa, urbano colonial. Ahora, yo reivindico el, el, la categoría porque, eh, porque aporta a, con una idea fundamental que es la, la idea de autorrelación. Idea de que las personas desarrollan respecto a sí mismas una, un autoconcepto eh, y cómo esta formación personal es vulnerable a los patrones de reconocimiento de los objetivos que también pueden comprenderse como regímenes de reconocimiento. Por lo tanto, la, la crítica a la dominación de tipo colonial y las fundamentaciones de la lucha anticolonial eh, han profundizado y afirmado que la emancipación del sujeto eh, no solo exige de desmontar la, las estructuras materiales y simbólicas de poder que mantienen el dominio, sino que también el efecto aplastador de la dominación en la dimensión subjetiva. Es decir, que requieren de una especie de purga psicológica. Eh, y bueno, igual me queda bastante, pero, pero eso ya es una, una lectura inspirada en eh, Glenn Cochran, que también es un autor traído en este seminario que me eh, aporta bastante al laberinto eh, la dominación eh, colonial y cuál es la salida. Eh, pero quizá aparezca en la en la discusión y el diálogo, así que lo voy a dejar. But maybe it will appear in the discussion and the dialogue. So that's it for me. Tu presentación. Thank you for your presentation. Now we give the floor.
to Camila Sanzana. Her presentation is Education Architecture, Principles of Modernization in the Design of Schools in Araucanía between 1883 and 1930. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, according to where you are. <clears throat> I wanted to see if you can see my screen. I think not yet. Not, not yet. Now it's loading. Can you see now? Yes, now we can see. We're starting. I wanted to say thank you for the invitation and for the topic because I think it's very relevant for the constant context that we are living especially in the context of a new constitution that is coming and that we hope that is more pluralist and that start questioning, questioning all these issues that we are presenting. Uh, I'm Camila Sanzana. I'm a student in my last year in architecture in Bio Bio University in Concepcion in Chile for everyone that is watching us from abroad. What I want to present is a research that I carry out for my thesis uh, that I'm thankful for being part of. This is um, the architecture in the borders that are part of the last presentation in the morning, Pablo was one of my guide teachers and he inspired my research. I talk about this from the base that we need to research how, what were the processes that consolidated through architecture or urbanism, the consolidation of the uh, nation state of Chile in Araucanía. We researched the concept of studying the education architecture as one of the ways or means that, that contributed to consolidate this uh, territory. My starting point is generate and elaborate what is the imaginary or what was the foundation of education in this territory. That's why my, my main topic is the principles of mo modernization. And the period that I'm talking about is the first period of the Fondesit project, this starts in 1883 and it finished in 19... It is something after the coup in Chile. That's why I start in, in 1883, which is the wrongly called the pacification of Araucanía, but it's the first full use and occupation of this territory in reality. In 1930, which was a period where it was a reductional territory, period of this territory, where they use different methods to reduct and reduce the indigenous population or to invisibilize them and leave them aside from the development that the state wanted for this territory. So this is how in this investigation or seminary, research or seminary, how we call it, 
in the academic aspect. This is a compilation of records to be able to talk about this topic in a better way. This is a compilation of the historical context of Araucania, where I put a lot of emphasis in what was going on with education as a model that was Chileanizing, to say so, the Araucania region. That's how this investigation research starts. About in seeing Chile as a state nation, as an entity that looks and uses the uh, education to Chileanize the territory, make it Chilean. Doing this through education for me, as I was carrying out this research, was a more pacific, quote unquote, way of doing this because implementing education as it was done here with Spaniard descendation, it was imposing a language and a way of living from one people and population to another. In this period, uh, the late part of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, this was a concentration in the first year's education. So here, the first that they start working with is the early year's education. and especially for the native kids. However, this education wasn't done through the state or the government, especially. They weren't the ones in charge to implement for implementing this. The state through these religion, religious mission, started implementing education in this Araucania region. They were, the religious groups were the ones that approach the native communities. The state, the only thing that did was provide land for the religious entities and give them founding so they could build churches, and schools where they could gather the native kids. The state didn't have an influence in what they were taught in schools. Their religious groups and churches were the ones that had control in what they were taught, the language and everything for the indigenous people. Thanks for the compilation of records that we had where we found things related not that much to architecture because there is so much material related specifically to our architecture. Talking about how it was at the beginning in Araucania, it was more related to historical records and there were a lot of pictures. So the research is mainly focus in this compilation of literature and photographs. Thanks to this, do it to this. We could start focusing and realizing that there were different education entities that started doing this. There is Escuela Misional, there is a school that the was part of the religious groups. We have images also of the religious missions in Tol, 
where we can see that it's predominantly the church building that imposes itself in this territory. And that's how I started translating it. And is this religious institution that first came to educate the native communities in the territories. We have other images. The building that we can see that is repeated in this image is from Tolchol. These are students that were close to these missions. These are images of some schools of these uh, religious institutions that in we have these buildings where from one side we have the church we have another building that is the like the boarding school we have different buildings with different structures but that have a linking common thing that it was implementing some specific type of education to indigenous communities. Eh, perdón, Camila. Perdón, es que vemos la primera, vemos la primera lámina. Quizá tienen que dejar de compartir y volver a compartir como compartir la pantalla. Sharing and sharing again. I was moving forward through the presentation and it wasn't showing. Thank you for letting me know. Ahora sí veo. Vemos el, el cambio. Sí, gracias. Thank you. Now we can see. Thank you for letting me know. This is when I was talking about the religious institution as the first one to implementing this education in Araucanía, this is an image of a possible classroom that was in these buildings from these religious missions. When I was talking about the Kepe mission, these were its building that were built the buildings from the Cholchol mission with native girls that were part of these schools. This Cholchol mission was only focused in girls. This is something that it was a tradition to say so that was brought from this Spaniard education where you have this gender-centered um, division and this was kept here through the state education and the religious education. Then they're starting showing up different buildings and architecture programs that were part of this. This is a like boarding school. Uh, at, a type of building that was repeated in the religious missions of education. These missions didn't work only through one building. They use very various different type of buildings, church, schools. I, here I wanted to highlight that that's the church building that we were seeing previously. Something that starts to being highlighted in these images and that I want us to reflect on is that we can see that these are institutions that were made to educate indigenous communities. And we can see that something that is highlighted is the clothes that the 
girls and boys are using. So these educational systems didn't only impose an idea and a language, but also clothes. Like place and that wanted to take them these indigenous kids from their culture. So we can see how our education that was seen as some that could be seen as something that's good, positive, and enriching in this territory was just a control mechanism. A, a mechanism to make Chile in this territory and to take it away from what it was and to get it under this Chilean nation, to say like that. Here's a quote. I think that I, I have some delay, but this is a quote that reassures, that confirms this role that these buildings had of the emissions. This control device that had uh, for Mapuches was through the buildings that was that came from a school, a mission, and a boarding school that allowed the Catholic missionaries complementing the process of occupation of Araucanía that started from the Chilean state. A second institution. Now we go to the second institution that was key and that contributed with the construction of many schools were these European colonies. If you don't know, Araucanía was made up from the beginning of the occupation in 1883 with a process of European immigration that was founded by the state in the first stage because they had an, the objective of giving founds to this first wave of immigration. And when the immigrants are here and they started developing themselves here, they will start an spontaneous immigration that the state wouldn't have to finance and give foundings for. They pay for 500 families, European families that came from Germany, France, and British colonies. The one that had a higher number of immigrants and that was translated in a bigger number of schools. It was the uh, German community in this map, I wanted to highlight where these communities were located and when where the schools were located also after. This was repeated in some of Andres maps and in some of other presentations where you can see that this concentration, centralized con concentration repeats itself from north to south of these settlements created by the state and also by these European colonies. The implementation of these European communities started creating a huge number of schools. And I wanted to show just a superficial insight or just a few pictures that allow us to have some image 
of this. The objective of this research is to create an imaginary and to give an idea of all the schools that were developed. This is one of the French schools of the French Alliance School that is in Trajan. And it's the first school of the French Alliance in Chilean territory. This is a um, famous uh, German school in Temuco that started at the beginning at the in the late part of the 19th century. Another example of a German school that it's in a more rural area of that time that it was from Contulmo. This is an example of a Swiss um, school that is still active and that in the beginning this was for, for kids that didn't have parents. It happened a lot that in this Swiss community that there were a lot of kids that were abandoned. They, these um, Swiss families came here and then they left. One example of the English school that was the only one that was in the territory and the last institution that was implemented they implemented education and that I wanted to highlight that implemented education in Araucanía is the public Chilean school. And this school is very important or this model is very important because this was the vision, the more transparent vision that the state had to implement education. Because in the previous two institutions, they the state only gave like a, a little funding. They gave and provided territory, but they didn't intervene so much in what was taught. They were just like mediators for land and territory. The first schools created and built by Chilean state were schools that were being replicated along the country. So the state didn't have so much influence. They didn't analyze the, the territories, the, the population to which people this education was being given to. They didn't analyze how to work with this education in these territories they didn't want to have the state didn't want to have a dialogue with the people that were already living here they just created like a pattern school and this is the one that i wanted to show because this is this repeats in three locations in araucania which is a, like a pattern default school and the state only copied replicated to create in this territory some hegemony this is at school in Tanaiko that it's still there, but now it's used as a cultural center that was rehabilitated, that now is part of uh, educational heritage and architectonic heritage in the area. And at a national level, these schools were always in front of the Plaza de Armas, like the square and very like downtown areas not like the schools that were in the near the indigenous communities these schools were made for the urban centers more than the rural 
areas. Here we see the structure of each school. We can see some flows that were in the schools. This is another school. And as we see, it's the same. And this school is in another municipality, but in the same Araucania region. There is only an interest of having a hegemony in this territory. This is also a school that was rehabilitated, but the huge, the biggest criticism is I visited this area where the school is. The biggest criticism is that the people don't know or the knowledge of the importance or the level of mechanism that these schools had. They don't know it. This school is used by the Puren municipality, but there is no like memory or, or knowledge about what happened or what meaning they had for the territory, for the indigenous culture. So we still have this kind of like impact that don't let us know about this. That my finishing words. Thank you so much for your presentation, Camila. We give you the word, Stefania Alvarez, with the last presentation of this table. Stephanie? I'm going to set the timer for the presentation. Can you see it? Yes, we can see. Okay, I want to present today the first conclusions of my research on my master called Women and Citizenship Studies. This is link in the Muco, Padre Las Casas, and the knowledge I have now, thanks to the formation I have in a very hegemonic environment. I'm going to be telling you about different things in my presentation. To understand the topic that I'm going to mention, this afternoon. The presentation is divided in different aspects. The first wants to address geography, ethnicity, and power. And it is divided this is divided in geography, ethnicity, and power. This is Linked to the theoretical framework, geographical imagery, and cartographic language, intersectionality, history, and gender stereotypes. And the study, the territory of study, and this, why I choose this territory and not other. And the second part that is more precise, it's the methodology. Uh, methods. Part. So this is from a method perspective, how to see from a feminist perspective, the inequality expressed in a territory. That's very, as an overview. Okay. So first part is linked with what I already to geography, SG, and power. So I took what Harley said. He works also with some Foucault's idea that I don't work with, but I do work with Harley's concepts to say that a map is never neutral and that it tends to establish the norm. That extends uh, mapping always 
say something from the vision of the person that elaborates it. Then we have expressed by Matuel that places show power relationships. So they maintain the norm and they also establish the boundaries of social and spatial. So identifying places, we can ask who belongs there on who is excluded from these spaces. Parallelly to the discussion that started in the early 2000s, we have this picture to the thought that it has been very masculine, let's say, and that in traditional Anglo Leography this has been very present. So the gender perspective has been incorporated to this study that is very masculine. There is also a critical use of geospatial technologies from different technologies that I'm going to show you later on. And finally, we also understand that the international hegemony of English has lessened other ways of thinking because from the academic perspective, we think that that's the way in which we should express our ideas. There is why also take into account what it was present in the last sessions. There are some concepts that are difficult to translate because we are in this concept as others who are uh, on the outskirts, we are not Western. We have to adapt to this main hegemonic vision to explain our thoughts, our feelings, and our reflections. On this context, we have different challenges of feminist theography that aims to identify different methods to visibilize the social differences in this point. And how do we express this in the territory? Here is where we incorporate the topic of city, geographic, imaginary, and African language. First, one says that the metaphor has power, and this is to transmit the language or a way to express an interpretation of place. So all the ways in which I express my ideas are communicating something from this place. So the ideas that Lindon expresses says that the streets are one of the most emblematic fragments and we can explore them through their names and memory. And this is very related to toponymy an expression of language. So this form of language of this form of memory is expressed in the streets, sometimes not so visible, but it does maintain this urban memory. Therefore, we have these three elements from history and an intersectional feminist perspective. We have linguistics that expresses the imaginary of places and geography that takes into account this power dynamic. We have toponymy that is able to express these three ideas and mapping or cartography shows us a visual of this issue. Nonetheless, what I study has a feminist focus. So how do I combine this territoriality problem with language and feminism? I explain this now. From intersectionality, there is this concept that tries to, it's, a, it's kind of a summary, let's say, the decolonial feminism and postmodern feminism. So if we take the idea of Hooks, Mohanty, and Stigma, we have a very interesting combination to talk about this intersectionality, racism, homogeneity of women from places that are traditional, what we, what is called a third word, and also Spivak, who talks about the predominant yes, the women who are on the other street, 
we haven't had the enough spaces to be able to express ourselves and explain ourselves under certain code or uh, that it is not easy to understand us how we want to be understood and know how we, they want to see. So I created some strategies of visualization in the spaces of the third word that is rationalized. And in fact, women of indigenous peoples have been visible and subjugated to the patriarchal order, but they have also been invisibilized in class and race. Race was amply discussed in the formation part. It's a topic that I don't know much about, but using these codes that are Eurocentric, this is an element that I use to explain myself in the end. So the territory of study is in the center south of Chile. We have this reference next to Argentina. And this territory was my choice specifically because of my life experience. That's where I was born, where I grew up, as a job in this territory. And that allowed me to watch some dishes, participate in different activities, not from an academic point of view, but also from a very active participation to make these issues visible, not from a power perspective, but from a visualization that is more equal and horizontal. So the, the goal of this study is to contrast the public presence of women in the city of the Mutu and Padre de las Casas through the critical cartography of toponymy in La Araucanía, Chile. The methods that we are using, it's something that it's first, it's an ongoing thought. It's been taken into account all the time. I started from a feminist perspective, so I looked for different strategies to support this, but the uh, uh, physical distance and virtual distance made this very difficult. So since October, I had to restructure these methods and I started to use information from National Institute of Statistics linked to the name of the state. Para después acotarlo solamente I made it work nationally, and then I reduced it to the area of study, considering that it's less than 0.5% of national information. We have 3,105 names that I analyzed here. So first I started with classifications. This is a very complex topic because it tends to be simplified. And it's part of the critics that I elaborated, but this was uh, justified and we worked with this from macro to micro. So these more than 3,000 names of streets are focused in the selection of people. And that people, I selected the ones named as women. And what do I understand for women? It's a group, very complex, in which things as class, religion, and other references are included. This is what Muhammad explains. Then there is also something very discussed, which is conceptualized as a place, different roles, sexism, classism, but considering also different alternatives to these dualities in the Mapuche peoples. They were transmitted through oral tradition that told me my 
grandparents who raised me. So I had this life experience that is not registered. There are no literary registers of this. So they are valuable for me to create this proposal. So here there is a table that shows how this information was organized. This is the table they used in the software. And then here we have a special expression that was used in Artists Online. I use this platform because it makes easy and available the information, even though I do not have a specialization in geography, someone who is interested can access this and check all the processes. And to be able to identify these spatial patterns, I use cartography from other sources, considering that eventually in the future, I should research more precisely on this. But recognizing the, the short academic period, I register this with external sources justify the register of the first education of the city. And here in the lower part, we can see the urban growth of the city in the year um, 1985 and 2017. And parallelly, we have this expression, this special consideration that occurs in specific periods. That is in what the author says, we can identify different moments of urban growth. In red, we see Mendoza that stays with three, uh, three state foundation growth and consolidation and in parallel we have the one that proposes the municipality of the Moco regulates this and they have five categories foundation and consolidation then uh village, village then we have the regional capital then it's recognized as a metropolitan center and then it talks about urban collapse and closer to this urban collapse or consolidation, depending on the first we want to use, is created the municipality of Padre de las Casas. So this space crossing the river is independent as administrative. The first special registry is closed from 1920s, and the second registry is um, half of. 1980s, and then the third one is closer to the current time. That allows us to recognize that the historical center is linked to denomination of people, so a real figure, a real person from history, from this past. All of that is represented in green color, and the historical area of the city has this consideration. Nonetheless, in these places that are more modern, let's say, such as La Veranza, they have different denominations. And if we do this from the feminist point of view, we can identify that these are the patterns of growth. Orange corresponds to male names and here we can see the names of women that are in the streets so we see that there are only two streets in the muco that are names of women and 23 are passages so these are there are, um, there are shorter there are smaller as well so now we have to work. What are the women present in Padre de las Casas and which women are absent here? Because this is a way of individualization. 
and why these women are not there? That's what we have the question. So let's see. Some of the reflections that I have is that these few people are from Spain, but not from Asia nor Africa, considering the people who arrived here. Um, it's also the hierarchy, the hierarchy component of this. And to help wrap it up, I wanted to show you this, and there you can also see some bibliography. Thank you very much for the case. Thanks, Stephanie. Your research is amazing. Congratulations. It's a great work that you presented. In the remaining time, are uh, just a minute, we will see if there is any question that you want to formulate. A question for Camila. I think it's interesting this crossing that you mentioned of information and the productive routes with the European colonial communities, what elements of analysis can you extract from this crossing? Do you think that education is or was or is still a reproduction of a system, colonial and system and method? Well, the first, elements for analysis that I could gather due to the material that was available. It was through images. It was images because at a architectonic level, I wasn't able to go to such profound analysis, but there were a lot of images that allow us to extract an analysis through their locations, which type of construction was carried out in the missional school, something that is it repeats itself a lot and that also it's repeated in other places in this you can see a way of building that is very religious, Catholic, and also European. You don't, it wasn't built through typologies or seeing what is already in the territory. Trying to follow the indigenous way of building. When I addressed this topic, I thought that the better, the best way of doing it was coming here and analyzing what other buildings were there already, but it wasn't like that. They didn't try to follow and harmonize with what was already built in the territory. And that happens in the missional school, in the European school, and that also happens in the schools of the Chilean state. So in this like photographic analysis, just by visualizing what is there, you can see how they built in this territory. You can analyze where they will build And the areas where these buildings are, these are important institutions that are far from the cosmovision or the understanding of the territory that indigenous people had. This was uh, 
mucho más siguiendo el relationship that went from the seas to the mountains but when they imposed the, these buildings in the territories these were less related to this cosmovision these were built from a south to north idea and backwards this reproduces a western system and they are still present from the colony times education has been a tool that was very manipulated and until now in the modern days since i'm here in the academy maybe now i'm seeing spaces that are being opened up with broader ideas or living behind this thing that education has the highlights what was written in history instead of analyzing it so that's why i like this research with this looking back perspective how with the perspective of how they carry out a hegemony in this territory that i feel part of without even being directly from a community. Thank you, Camila. Do we have a question for Andres? Sí. Sí. Andres. Yes. Andres, do you believe that this settler colonialism focus, it's a good focus to understand Chilean colonization of Araucanía or would we need another one eh, like internal colonialism? Bueno, esa es la, colonialism. El seminario well, parte de las preguntas del seminario S. Um, one of the questions of the seminary is that diría I que, will say that que, claro, son marcos de análisis. Of course, son these teorías. are different Entonces, um, analysis frameworks no and theories. So we should think what theory no I, I wouldn't choose neither. Tradición. Each ca category has their eh, por mucho tiempo me own characteristics. Eh, la idea for a long time, I was questioning this idea of internal colonialism because eh, I, I don't like the internal aspect eh, eh, for the relationship with the indigenous communities. Silvia Rivera, eh, Rivera works a lot with this. Lo, la, Los estados with the idea that the hacia el interior. Eh, sin nation states que start colonizing eh, internally, se está dejando but this is living de aside the de de sovereignty of hay the una, communities. Hay una trampita ahí en el análisis. En cambio, so I think there is like a little settler trap, but the bueno, settler colonialism no, no concept does not bring this um, problem, este de, 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 this de problem of the como parte del position no que, of um, the one that is colonized problemas, pero internally. It brings other settler, problems, o sea, but that has to do with the settler part. A, that could lead, un, it brings de un like an ideological casi en su fase de concept o sea, that de, is almost de, ending de, de in the ending phase. Y, y es el, 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 la, and that's la inercia estructural de, the que a veces criticada. Pero, dice, the relationship that es un, es un he criticized. Es, la verdad es que me parece que el, la idea de colonización mediante poblamiento al estilo eh, anglosajón, eh, evidentemente, Obviously, es muy productivo para it's comprender, very productive como bien to understand, Camila, eh, like Camila said, todos estos procesos de colonización, this propiamente, colonization eh, processes, 
que son distintos a lo que ocurre en el resto de América Latina. Eh, ahora bien, hay dos componentes que eh, eh, complejizan bastante el, 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 el caso chileno, y es la categoría de mestizos. And eh, that the complicated no is the desde donde surge mixed este concepto, category, el mundo anglosajón, de mestizo, donde las eh, diferencias raciales eran mucho, mucho más marcadas que en Latinoamérica. With the English eh, world. Y también eh, subsume la idea de colonización mediante poblamiento la inercia histórica de las relaciones hispano-coloniales. Que And obviamente yo this vengo a. Makes disappear the. A, a, um, Hispanic. A eh, colonialism. Pero. Relationship. Eh, pero en general, efectivamente, cuando se, se importa la categoría. When you bring this. Volamiento, eh, colonization through a, population. A pasar por alto. Que category. De relaciones you are ignoring. That eh, there que obedecían a otra lógica colonial. As, y eso podemos, uh, Hispanic colonia, parece, eh, colonial de, aspect in that I think that ejemplo, we can see until now and we can see the consequences. For example, where it's better applied this category in Argentina or Araucanía, there are key differences, de, especially with the, de de the status de of the recognition eh, of rights in the territories. That Así difference que, that exists in Argentina and in Chile. Ante la so I think de estudios, because we don't eh, have, of, because of the lack of studies related of this con un de particular, special, eh, spatial concept ante la de of estudio es colonialism through population. Eh, la, el it is key y muy productivo the que tiene este concepto, intuitive aspect of this concept and theory, but, ya uno la trae, hay que hacer but when you bring it, you have to create different que ocurren, eh, aspects acá. and layers Pero to understand what happens here. But I think it's a very no important question and that it doesn't end or it's not finished Gracias. in this discussion. Thank you, Andres. There is any other question so we can finish for the speakers? No? No? Okay. Considering the time, since we are over time, we will finish this table. The presentations were very important and very different in terms of analysis and let us understand how the urban aspects transformed the rural aspects. And this concept of water and production, there's a very profound topic of how we have this name, a study name of the streets is very interesting. The, in the North part, the streets that were named after Peruvian figures were changed to Chilean military people afterwards. Uh, for the afternoon, I would like to invite you to watch a video at 5 p.m. We will start at 5 with a video called from Jacobi can Yes, and it will be moderated for, for for Carlos Cornejos. And I invite you to watch this video that has a lot to do with the topic of our seminary. And we finish now.
Thank you to all the speakers and the people that were watching us. Thank you very much. We will see you in the afternoon.